Well, welcome to Grace Church San Diego. My name is Nolan Lee. I'm your interim lead pastor. And today I get the joy, I get the honor of kicking off a brand new series called Temptation Island. Yes, you heard me right. Temptation Island. Some of you are laughing right now because you remember you're old enough or you're young enough to remember that there was this show on Fox in the 2000s and it was called Temptation Island. And the whole concept of the show was they would take committed couples. They weren't like married, but they take these committed couples, they put them on an island, and then they take some promiscuous singles and put them on that island and see if their relationship could withstand that temptation. And, you know, I just remember my parents talking about being like, why would anyone put their relationship through that? But then two, why did we watch that? Why did Americans watch that? Well, the namesake isn't so much this show, it's more of actually a word picture that I wanna paint for you because a lot of times in our life, we're, we're sailing along and as we're kind of going through the ups and downs of the ocean of our lives, there's some point or multiple points where we hit a storm and this storm kind of disorients us and we end up you know, shipwrecked on an island. And as we come to and we, we take in our surroundings and we, we look around this island, we see that at every twist and turn, there are deadly temptations right in front of us. And so the first thing that we do is we run. We try and, we try and escape and we, we, we start to realize that the edges of the island that we're, we feel like we're actually trapped. And so then maybe our next tactic is to go and try and live with, in harmony with the temptations and to just kind of do what their will is and, 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 and lean into that. And that, that ends horribly as well. And so then finally, we get to this place where we're so fed up, we're so tired, we go and we, we build a raft, so to speak, out of our own ingenuity, our own strength to try and get off the island. And we're heading out to the reef and all of a sudden this big wave you know, crashes and smashes our reef and we end up face down in the sand right where we started. And it, it leads us to this place where we feel trapped, trapped on this temptation island. We, we don't know how to escape and we don't know what to do. And, and maybe that's you today. What, what would make up your temptation island? What would be on it? Maybe for you, I'm, I'm just depicting your reality. You're like, no, my life is a mess. And th yeah, this is exactly how I feel. Or maybe some of you too have been walking with Jesus for a while and you've given Jesus access to most of your life. But but if we're being honest, there's still a little holdout. There's still a little atoll, a little island that you're holding out to that fits this description of Temptation Island. But, but for a second, what is your Temptation Island? Maybe, maybe for some of you, it's partying. It started off innocent and it was once a weekend and now it's just getting out of control and you're leaning into substance abuse and when you're around these friends, you just can't control yourself. That is your Temptation Island. Or maybe for some of you, it's, it's kind of anger and bitterness. You have a fight with a friend and you just find yourself being tempted to go into that anger place and to start doing character assassination and gossip. That's your temptation island. Maybe for some of you, it's porn. It's looking at illicit images. Or maybe that's not you. It's having an emotional affair with a coworker or a friend. But that is your temptation island. Maybe for some of you, it's none of that. Maybe for you, it's overcommitment. You can't help but say yes to any ask that comes before you, even when it's in contrast to what you feel God's leading to you to. That's your temptation island. Or maybe there's a the last group of you where it's, where it's overworking and, and earning your value through promotions, or it's being the perfect parent. That is your temptation island. We all, I think, have some area that this depicts our reality, our temptation island. And what do we do? What do we do when we're here? What do we do if you, you feel that feeling of being shipwrecked there? Everything that you've tried has fallen short. What do we do? How do we escape? Because we all know that we want the full life that we can find, the freedom that we can find in Jesus. And yet sometimes our reality doesn't match up with that. We feel like we're a puppet, you know, falling at every whim of our temptation. What do we do when we're in this place? Well, there is a way. There is a way, and not only is there a way forward, there's also a way to flourish amidst all the temptations around you. And that is exactly what we're gonna be talking about in this series. Each week, we're gonna come into this and we're gonna learn something new so that we can flourish amidst the deadly temptations of our life. And today, we're gonna to start off with the basics, the foundation of understanding what temptation is and also really you know, disorienting and, and tearing apart 
are misconceptions that we have in it. And so I want you to open to James chapter 1, uh, 13 through uh, 16. We're going to look at verse 13 through 16. And while you turn there, I want to give us some context because it's always important to know the author and also kind of the context. And so James, James is our author and he was actually the brother of Jesus. And what, what makes this so interesting is that James actually didn't believe Jesus was the savior when Jesus was living. In fact, he might have thought like, hey, this, I love my brother, but he's crazy. He's amassing all these followers. He, he didn't believe in him until Jesus dies. He comes back from the dead and he appears to James post-mortem. All of a sudden, James goes through this transformation. And then we see that James becomes this leader in the Jerusalem church. And one historian described James's knees as having elephant skin-like calluses from all the time he spent in prayer. We see that James is fully transformed to this devoted life of following after not only his, his earthly brother, but, but Jesus, his savior. And in fact, he ended up paying the ultimate price in 62 AD. He was martyred. He was killed for his faith just 29 years after Jesus' death. And so the book of James is actually a letter, and it's written by James. And in this letter, there's this overarching theme that faith and action are interrelated. You can't have faith without action. And we're coming into the very beginning. And just right off the bat, you'll notice that James just jumps into it, and he starts painting the picture that following Jesus can be challenging. And he's about to transition where we're going to join and talk about temptation. So let's pick up in verse 13. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's fully grown, brings forth death. Wow, are you awake? (laughs) James, don't you just love how blunt James is? He doesn't mix words. I actually really do enjoy that, though, because he cuts to the core, and he cuts right past everything, and he communicates very clearly, and he, he lets us know some things right off the bat that we can see. The first one is this. If we're trying to understand temptation, the first thing we need to know is that God can't tempt us. So if you're thinking that God's playing games with you, that God's tempting you, we see right here that that's not true. And then the second thing that's very important is maybe as I was talking through the temptation island concept you were sitting back and you're just thinking, and if we're just being honest, you're thinking, Nolan, yeah, I I have my temptations, but I kind of like them. And not only that, but I kind of like what's happening. It's fun. And I don't think it's harming anyone. There's no problem with it. Giving into my temptation isn't, isn't causing anybody problems. I'm comfortable here. And we, if that's you, look at those last words of James when he says, sin, when it's fully grown, brings forth death. I hate to break it to you, but even if you're comfortable, even if you're happy right now, at some point, your sin will eventually lead to spiritual death. No one wakes up one morning and decides, hey, I want to lean into my temptations, then I want that to start snowballing into this big sin that eventually ruins my life or my marriage or my career. No, it happens slowly over time with compromises. And so maybe that's you and that's all you need to hear today. You need to be challenged by that. But this, this is kind of our starting point. And and now we're going to transition. We're going to talk about the big thing of today. And James alluded to it. It's a key truth that if we don't understand, if we don't live into, we're going to be caught in this spin cycle of temptation. And it's this. This is the simple truth. Temptation is not sin. Temptation is not sin. Man, do we get this one messed up. We think that these two are are the same thing. And and when we do this, it leads into the self-fulfilling, self-defeating kind of prophecy. And so I want to spend some time unpacking this because if we want flourishing full life, we got to understand this. So let's start with just some simple definitions. What is sin? Sin is simply deciding to disobey God. That's the simple definition. Sin is deciding to disobey God. Now, God creates everything good in this world. We know that. And so he gives these two things and he tells us how they're meant to be used. When we decide to do something contrary to God's will, that's sin. And so that's really important for us to share. That's sin. Now let's transition over here to temptation. What is temptation? Temptation is feeling or wanting to disobey God. 
feeling or wanting to disobey God. This is so important too because the two actually lead up to each other if we look at this, right? Temptation takes us up to this point where it's leading and guiding us towards wanting and feeling to disobey God. And at some point, that transitions now into sin when that decision happens because you can't have sin on accident. You can't have sin without wanting or leaning into or deciding to agree with temptation. So although these two work together, they are two separate things. And let's play this out with a practical example of this. So let's say you're walking down the street and you look up and you notice someone attractive of the opposite sex, right? You see them in that moment when you notice that they're attractive and you see them, are you sinning? Are you sinning by thinking, hey, this person is attractive? No, no, you're being tempted. In fact, what happens now at this moment is it's going to start leaning maybe into a boiling point. It's going to build on top of itself. The temptation is going to lead you and say, hey, you know what? Maybe you should look at them again. And this time, notice all the contours and hey, you should do this. And the moment that you decide either in your head are also in person to do that, it is now transitioned into sin. It's gone from temptation and it takes over into sin. This is so important that we understand this distinction and how they work together. I actually want to give kind of an illustration or a simile for this. And so it's the month of October, right? And maybe some of you are watching a scary movie or watching a TV show. And in all of these, there's this classic set of scenes that happen. And so I want to play these out because you have this character and let's say they're walking along. And for the sake of this illustration, we're going to use, they see a, a scary house, a spooky looking house on the end of the street. And so they're walking along in the first scene, they notice it, and you can see that they're intrigued by it. But what do they do? They keep walking, and you're, you're relieved. You're like, don't, why would you go there? Well, then the second scene happens. In the second scene, they're walking, they look at the house, and this time, they're a little bit, they're kind of, they want to know more. And so they start walking, and they open the gate, right? And then they start walking down the sidewalk, and you're starting to sweat at this point. You're like, what are you doing what are you doing? Turn around. And they go and they, they take a step up the front porch and then all of a sudden there's a creak and they, they get frayed and they run off and you're like, you feel relief. And then finally, the classic third scene happens. And this is the one where we end up yelling at the TV. They walk past the house. They, they open the front gate. They're, they're walking up. They walk up on the front porch and then they reach for the door handle. And I don't know why. They always do a close-up of the hand turning the door handle. And at this point, this is when you're standing on top of the couch and you're yelling. You're like, turn around. What are you doing? They open the door and then they walk through the door. And at this point, you're so let down. Your hands are in front of your face and you're yelling because what happens every single time? The door slams behind them. They just entered. In fact, if you study film, this is called the point of no return for the character. At this moment, right? And this is similar to sin. This is similar to the relationship between temptation and sin, but also the distinction. The first time when they walked by, if we're using that as our metaphor, they weren't sinning. They were just being tempted. The second time, same thing. They were being tempted. Third time, at what moment did it transition into sin? When they walked through the door. It's the point of no return. And James gets at this, right? He gets at this in verse 15. He says, Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's fully grown, brings forth death. James uses this pretty graphic illustration of conception, but there is a point. James is saying there is a point at which this transitions. And why this is so important, because maybe some of you, up to this point, you're tracking with me. In fact, maybe at this point, you're like, Nolan, I, you know what? I know this sermon. I know where it goes. I grew up in church. I know that, you know, temptation and sin are different. But, but here's something really important. Knowing truth and living truth are two different things. Knowing truth and living truth are two different things, because maybe you know this truth, but then you don't live it out. Right? I think a lot of us might know this truth, but we don't live it out. We live in a way that's in contrast to this because we live in a way that the moment we feel tempted, we want to disobey God or we feel like that, we think it's a foregone conclusion. We've already lost, and so we actually just give up. We give up too soon, and we just go down. We think that temptation is a one-way street down to sin, and so we just give up too soon. Maybe for you, what this looks like, that moment, that kind of point at which you just say, you know what, shame's going to take its course. I'm already, I'm already going to sin, so I might as well. Maybe for you, you're driving home from work and you see that liquor store sign or you see that bar 
and you think in your head, I should just forego, it sounds really good, I should just kind of forego my sobriety maybe, I don't know, what, should I do that? And that even just that thought, which is a temptation thought, all of a sudden, you just, you're just like, you know what, that's so, how could I even think that? And you're so shameful about that. And you think that you're sinning, that you just go down the path and you make that decision. Or maybe for you, you find yourself wanting to skip a meal to look a certain way for that person. And even in, in thinking and feeling that way, you just give in because you're like, I've lost this battle so many times. Or maybe you go online, you're feeling, you're feeling lonely and you go online or you reach out to that person for, to meet that need and you're doing it through lust, you're doing it through the wrong things, but, but you're, you haven't gone that far. You're just in the first stages and you're feeling like you wanna do that and even in that feeling, you're so shameful that you just let it go full blown into the path towards sin. Maybe for you, it's overcommitment. Maybe for you, it's, it's overworking. Maybe for you, it's being the perfect parent. Whatever it is, there's this point at which we're being tempted and we start just agreeing with that without even knowing it. We lean into that it's a foregone conclusion. We give up too soon. We think that we've lost and this is the problem. This is why it's so important. This is why it can transform our spiritual lives because that very moment that we are being tempted, it's almost like in a car, it's a, a check engine light. It's flashing at us. It's letting us know it's an indicator. Hey, you are about to sin. You are being tempted. You are about to sin. And the sad truth is, although we might know the truth that it's not sin, we might be living in a way that we just give it. We give it the reins and we give the temptation. We just say, we just give into it and we eventually sin. And so some of us, we need to hear clear as day from God's word, the truth about this. And we also need to be empowered in this. How, how do we take a step forward? What is the truth in this? And so we're gonna look at actually Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 13. This is so beautiful. Actually write this verse down or mark it in your phone if you're struggling with this because this, this is power for you. Paul says, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. I want to pause here because that's actually, that is just mind boggling. And some of us, oh man, we miss this. No temptation is overtaking you except what is common to mankind. Sometimes we feel, I've felt this way. Maybe you felt this way, but we think I'm the exception to the rule. You don't understand, Nolan. I have temptations unlike you. In fact, if you knew my childhood, if you knew my background, my temptations are stronger than you. I'm just weak in this area. So my temptations are worse than you. And we give in to this lie. Look at how Paul teases it out. He says, no, 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 no. This is common to mankind. Whatever you're experiencing, it's just the garden variety temptation. Now that might be a hard truth because I think it reveals maybe where we're not living into God's truth, but it's also very helpful because we can know the temptation that we face, we have that in common with our brother and sister next to us. And then Paul continues. He says, and God is faithful he will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. This is like a, a soothing bomb to our soul right now because some of us, we, we've been viewing it as a one-way path, but look at what Paul paints. He paints a fork in the road. He says, hey, temptation leads you down this road that comes to a point. And at this point, you have two options. You lean into sin. You decide to sin. You decide to disobey God or you endure it and you grow closer to God. You lean in through that. And some of us need to hear this because we think there's no way out. We think there's no possibility. And you know what? We're right on our accord. If we try and do this by ourselves, out of our own strength, and that's why we end up stranded, our rafts end up breaking, uh, getting off temptation island, we end up back in the sand because we try and do it by ourselves. But look who gives that opportunity, God. God will always provide a way out for you. He always does, he always has. And just because you haven't taken it doesn't mean it's not there. And so this, we need to hear this, we need to live into this because when we feel tempted, that's the very moment to start fighting and leaning in and asking God, show me, where is the way out? And so this is our base foundation for this series, right? This is, this is our starting point. And I know a lot of us want to jump forward into victory. A lot of us just want to know, but if we do that, we might just get into behavior modification, right? And so we want to start by taking inventory. Let's get a lay of the land of our spiritual journey with temptation. So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna give you two questions. 
I want you to take out a phone or a piece of paper and pen. I want you to write these questions down because what we're gonna do is this next week, I want you to spend time praying through and asking the Holy Spirit to reveal the answers to these questions because I think a lot of times we're, we just try and do self-help. That's gonna lead again to just ruin. So this is how we're gonna do it. We're gonna rely in prayer through the Holy Spirit that he's gonna bring these to the table. So hopefully you have your pen and paper. Here are the two questions. Number one, what temptations are on your island? What temptations are on your island? You might be able to say, well, no, and of course I know my temptations, but I even think if you've been following Christ for a long time, in our deception, in our, in our sin, in our shameful nature, we can actually hide out a temptation that's, that's over here. And so ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you where are all your temptations. Ask that and spend time listening. And then the second piece is this. During your temptations, at what point do you feel like you've already lost? During your temptations, at what point do you already feel like you've lost? I think this one is so important to us because again, there is this moment, there is this, there's this lie that we have that we give into and so we need to let the Holy Spirit tease that out and reveal it to us. And so this week, as you lean into that time with God, let's start with this foundation. Each week, we're gonna build upon this and we're gonna give you tools, practical tools, to again, flourish amidst deadly temptations. But we need to start here. And so remember, temptation is not sin. Temptation is not sin. You haven't already lost if you're feeling tempted and God will always provide a way out. So let's pray together, church. Jesus, we just recognize that you are here with us, no matter if we're in our house or our car. Lord, you are here with us and you have a plan. Lord, you have a way out for us. And so God, because of that, because there's hope, because too, Lord, we know there's a more full life, I just wanna lift up a group of people. If you've been following Christ for a long time, but you've justified or you've hidden, there's an area, there's a temptation island for you. Maybe it's a small area, maybe it's a glaring area. Jesus, will you just reveal that to us? Will you tease that out? Will you cast out shame, but in a healthy way, Lord, bring forth the guilt to see what that area is? And maybe there, there's another group of you today, and maybe you've never actually made the decision to follow Jesus. In fact, when I was bringing up at the beginning just sin, you, you know that, you know sin, and you know that every attempt is falling flat. Every, every way that you can try and make up for your wrongs is falling flat, and you know that there's a better life, there's a fuller life with Jesus, and you want that. If that's you, I want you to pray this prayer, something similar in your own heart. It's just simple. Ask Jesus into your heart. Ask him and say, Jesus, I, I want to follow you. I know that you died. You rose again so that I can be freed from sin. And no matter what I do, I can't do that by myself. So I need you. And not only do I need you, I want to follow you. I want to see how you will frame in my life. I want to go on the adventure with you. I want to see the journey that you have before me because my journey has not been good. And Jesus, for us as a church, will you guide Will you lead, will you expose, will you bring out, and will you empower us to deal with our temptations? We lift this up in Jesus' name, amen.